and you ask all the questions or they send you in some. They might send me in some and we'll see if we have time to answer a few. I've asked some people that preliminarily to ask um, some questions. So, okay. And it's and now it's saying it's doing its thing. It should be kicking live here in a second. I see it already saying live on Facebook. Oh, nice. All right. Well, we're live then. Okay, great. Yeah, look at that. Um, hey, um, welcome. Conversation with um, Major League Umpire and Crew Chief Fielding Cubby Culbreth. Uh, Cubby, you don't need much of an introduction. I think everyone knows who you are. I I, I want to say that. So, uh, first of all, thanks so much for coming on uh, umpatire.com's The Dish. Uh, right in the middle of the World Series, we wanted to do something, interview uh, Major League Umpire, and, um, and, and have you join us tonight. Welcome. Thank you very much. I, if you say everybody knows me as an umpire, mm, I'm going to have to sit here and think about whether that's a good thing or not. Well, I think it's a really good thing. You know, you're, you're, you're an, one of the first umpires that my kids recognized. When we first got involved with Ump's Care Charities, how many upteenth years years ago? Yeah. Um, and I said that I met this umpire named Cubby. Well, obviously they were all they were younger, and so every time there was a game on, uh, I was watching TV. You know, they would say, "Is that Cubby? Is that Cubby there?" <laughs> so, so tell you know that's one thing that that I would like to know about is where did that nickname Cubby come from? Well, believe it or not, uh, it's I, the only thing I can say is that it must have derived from my last name, which is Cub Riff, you know. So this goes back to when I was in, I mean, elementary school. I just had a few of my friends that called me Cubby, and it just took off from there, and people referred to me as that. And I can tell you right now, as this minute, uh, my wife of going on 22 years has never, if she's ever called me Fielding, I don't think I can remember where it was. As a matter of fact, she said Cubby right. at the altar. She said Is that Cubby right? The, she did. It was in she your said, vows, right? I don't think she knows my, I don't think she truly knows you who she married. Her, you haven't she told She doesn't know who she married. <laughs> wow, that's something. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I've i never known you as as fielding as well. I've known you for years. Um, uh, I remember when when you first uh, were involved with uh, with Ump's Care via Blue, uh, Blue for Kids and um and talked to you many years ago and and you know never heard anyone call you fielding and then it was a funny story you may not know this but we spelled your name wrong on one of the graphics that we did fielding we spelled it uh, f-i-e-l-d-e-n right and so the, from what i understand now it sounds like maybe that was okay because your wife doesn't even know what your first name is that's exactly right and that's i can good. assure you i've never checked into a hotel that they had the the name the first name or the second name that right? correct anyhow so but we, now the word know. fielding though the word fielding as i understand it is a long family name right it I mean, is there's a history it is. There. you want to share my, what that history is yes my son actually uh is the fourth now and uh the story i got you know i didn't think anything about it for years and years and years and then i i had a couple people ask me you know where does that come from you're the third and all this kind of stuff. So I just asked my dad in the story that he tells me, and this was the story that was told to him, is that many years ago in the Civil War, that uh, they were two buddies and uh, they were side by, and they made a pact with each other that, you know, if something happened, they would go and tell their, uh, their family that, you know, they loved them and they were good. Everything was, you know, sad that they weren't coming home, but they just wanted them to know that they loved them, all this kind of stuff. So the story is one of the guys did die and the other guy went and told the, the family and, and became really good friends with the family. Okay. And the story is that they became so close to him and his name was Fielding that one of them uh, named their, uh, their son Fielding. Mm -hmm. And hence it got passed down to grandfather and then my dad and then myself and uh, now my son. Oh, wow. So it started so off with, along. So he's not, he's not um, uh, Cubby the fourth. He's or Cubby the second. You didn't pass that on to him. Strangest thing. Yeah. I, like I said, I never gave myself that nickname. Uh -huh. uh, people just did it, but they, it's, it's like it hasn't stuck with anybody else in the family. That's I, I don't understand. Well, what so, I know, you know, a lot of major league umpires have nicknames, but they're not as popular as yours. I mean, there are some that 
when you're playing golf with them at the golf classic, I will hear names. And I'm like, wow, I never knew that person was refer uh, you know, referenced in that way. And, um, you know, even Jim Joyce uh, playing golf with him, you know, everybody called him Jimmy, you know, that was, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, so, so you hear these nicknames and uh, Gary Darling, you know, his nickname is Zap. And that's a great story for another, it is for another, <laughs> for, for another time, yeah. you know, but yours, everyone knows you as Cubby. So I, I wanted to get that out there and talk about Cubby and, and Fielding and all those words and apologize to me, apologize to you for spelling your name wrong in one of the graphics that we had. Here we have a first MLB umpire on one of our calls, and we spell his name wrong on a graphic. So, so, so that's there you go. There. So that's uh, so you let us let us off the hook there. Uh, appreciate that. But if you're just joining us, um, we are here with Major League Umpire and Crew Chief Fielding Cubby Culbreth. We're just gonna we're gonna forget the Fielding name for the rest of the night now, and just go with Cubby uh, that's since good. that's what you're comfortable with, and I'm comfortable with as well. And um, but we're you know again, welcome to tonight. What a year it's been, 2020. Can you tell us a little bit about what 2020 has been from your angle, from your perspective? Well, I can tell you, it is, it's been crazy. And, uh, you know, it's had its good and it certainly had its bad. And to be honest with you, I can't wait for it to get out of here. I never wish my life away, but I'll be ready for it to get out of here. But it's, you know, it's been strange because it, you know, it started off like a, like any other year, right? You know, we go and, we, we go to our umpire, um, umpire retreat in January, like we always do. And that's where typically I'll see you at the, uh, at the golf outing and things like that. And, and uh, we go for our physicals and all that kind of stuff and come back home, have a few days with the family. And then it's time for spring training, we go to spring training. Everything's rolling, you know, along like usual. Then all of a sudden somebody mentions this virus and, you know, the rest is history as far as that's concerned, but it just, you know, it, it truly flipped everything upside down. I, don't, I think early on, uh, being that nobody knew just how serious it was, it was just this, you know, I think truthfully, when I left spring training, I thought, eh, we'll be out a week or two and, mm -hmm. and then we'll be back to playing baseball. But, you know, needless to say, it just, it didn't turn out that way. And, uh, and uh, it's taken on a life of its own now and it changed everything uh, and it, it it got to the point where i had to decide with the seriousness of it you know what i was going to do as far as a personal decision when they gave people the opportunity to opt out you know i'd love to still be 25 years old but i'm not i'm you know 58 uh just about three pounds overweight <laughs> and, you know, I have some things that I have to take serious. Plus I'm, you know, I'm getting to that point uh, now in my career where uh, retirement's a, a real thing, something I'm starting to talk about and uh, just talk with my family and, and, and got to thinking that, you know, with all those things in mind that maybe this year uh, was the time to, to not take the chance. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of it or not. I've, I've always worked. I've always gone out there and missed very few games in my career. I, I would say that I could count the, uh, the number of games that I've missed in my career on uh, maybe three hands. Uh, so, it, but it was, it was something that I had to, to take serious and, and I decided to, uh, to opt out. It was not an easy decision. Uh, you feel like you're letting down your crew as a crew mm -hmm. chief. You feel like you're letting down your colleagues as an umpire. And you feel like you're letting down your uh, employer. And, and all those things went through my mind. And, and it was not an easy decision. And, you know, you would think that if you're thinking about a potential life and death situation, that it, well, that's easy. Right. I'll, ch I'll choose life over death. But right. uh, it wasn't. And it was one that I struggled with up until the final day. And quite frankly, I had all intentions of working until that very last minute when, when I just, you know, it just, I guess more than anything at that time, because we didn't know how this thing was going to work out. And it just hit me that, you know, why am I going to do this? You know, why am I going to take that chance? And uh, I am certainly thrilled to death that they got through the season. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's good for baseball. Right. I think it shows a lot for everybody that, that we got out there and, and, and they, they carried on with the season, but it was, uh, you know, hindsight being 2020, uh, maybe I could have done it, but you know what? I've, I've decided 
that day when I made the decision, I wasn't going to look back. I was just going to go ahead, uh, spend time with my family that I haven't. This was the first time. Wow, in, right. In third yeah, so tell us about that. This how the, has how you you've been able to do something that, um, you know, not many people have had a chance to do, which is to take a break in this really long umpiring career. I mean, uh, umpiring is is a uh, you know year in year out. We know that major league umpires uh, don't have a don't have a home game, right? Unless yes. you happen to live yeah. in your home area, right? So that's some, something right. that a lot of people don't don't really understand and realize um, is that your the commitment to that, and you know it might be something that would be nice for every major league umpire to get to pick one year out of in the middle of of their career to take to take a break and to step back and to. Uh, to spend time with family and things like that. So I know that you were not the only uh, major league umpire to, to opt out this year. And I know from the, the people that I uh, network with and, and um, uh, at whatever levels and, and our customers and our staff, you know, I don't think anyone looks upon anyone negatively who, who yeah. chose that decision. Yeah. And so I hope that you feel that as well. Um, and um, so tell, tell me what it was like to have a, uh, to have a, uh, to be off. How did that feel? What was that like? Well, right after my divorce, I'll be able to tell you that because I tell you one thing, I was threatened with that about 10 different times. Oh, I okay. Mean, okay. Think yeah. about, right. Yeah. So think, your wife wasn't used to having it. you home. And didn't like it. <laughs> no, it was, it was different. And it was different right. in a way that was crazy for everybody because uh -huh. we're talking about uh, for, for all these summers, I've been gone for summers for 34 years. This is right. the first time, this is the first time in 34 years I've had a birthday at home. It's the mm. first time in, uh, 20 years that I was at home for my son's birthday. That's great. So, you know, it was, it was a lot of new, uh, a lot of first and, uh, and it was a lot of getting used to being there during the parts of the year that I'm not there other than mm -hmm. a brief in the house and right back out of the house. And, uh, it's, uh, took a lot of getting used to and, and needless to say, I have an unbelievable wife who was patient and understanding of my situation and, and supported me all the way. And, uh, that certainly made things easier. And, and then we sat out in the driveway and did a whole lot of talking that's all you could do for at least right. the first couple of months around here. So sure. it was, it was different, you know, it's different, but, uh, uh, I, I tell you what it did give me, it gave me a, a good glimpse into my future oh. and it doesn't yeah. look so bad. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm still ready to go back out and, and do this for another couple of years, maybe three, but, uh, the future doesn't look so bad either. I, I think life away from baseball is, is going to be manageable, you know? Well, that's great. And I, I know every, everything about you where, where you have been able to adjust in every situation you've been in, in, you know, you came from a small town. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Cubby's from Inman, South Carolina. It's a town of about 2,300. It reminds me of my town, uh, Harlan, Kentucky. Uh, we had, we had 3,200. So we were just a little, we were bigger than you guys in Inman. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing that I always knew about Harlan was anytime you asked any, anybody asked you outside, uh, you know, where, where are you from? And you'd say Harlan. And I don't know if it was accent or what, but people would always say, what Harlem, what, what are you saying? So, so uh, I'm sure you had the same thing being from a very small town in, in South Carolina um, as well. So what's that like for you to, to start at a really small town and eventually make it to the big leagues? You know, I didn't, I didn't think about it early on, uh, and I don't, I don't really know why, but it hit me. It, it really didn't hit me until that first night I made it to the, to the big leagues uh, that when I went out there the first time ever in my career and I just as a call up umpire, uh, you know, I walked out there and there was, you know, 39, 40,000 people and the noise and the size and all those things. And, and, you know, you sit there and like you say, man, you can get a whole lot of Inman's in 39,000 people, you know, right. <laughs> and that's when, it, yeah. that's when it, that's when it hits you that uh -huh. the, the, the lights are brighter, everything's bigger. Uh, but I, I don't know. It's, it's like, I think more than anything, it kept me grounded and it still keeps me grounded today because fr quite frankly, Nobody cares. Inman is a small town. Right. 
everybody knows everybody. Uh, you know, there wasn't these cliques in high school because you knew everybody. Not only right. did you know everybody, you knew everybody's parents and they knew you and they knew your parents. So nobody was overly impressed. Nobody's overly impressed today. <laughs> uh, so I like that. Home is home. And that's right. the reason, you know, uh, quite frankly, I, I, I guess I have the ability to move and call anywhere home, but I, I still stay here. I've, uh -huh. I've made the big move six miles up the road to Spartanburg, South Carolina. Oh, well, that you. was that. Yeah. That's how no, I moved up to the, <laughs> moved up to the big city. That's right. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. That's uh, for those of you who don't know, Inman is, is outside of, uh, Spartanburg, uh, Greenville area, South Carolina. I had looked that up, uh, just to make sure I have a, I have a friend that's from, from Irmo. And I, and I just yeah. thought for a second when I looked up Inman, I thought, is my friend from, from the same place as, as Cubby, but his is Irmo and yours is Inman. So, um, we have that same thing in you know, Irmo. A lot, yeah. of, a, lot of, a lot of towns sound sound the same. So, but no, back on that whole track of where you have made adjustments and you have found you know happiness no matter what your situation. You uh, were a baseball player in high school, and you went on to play in college. Tell us what happened in college that ended up being a transition for you to umpiring. Well, my story is. Uh, and, and I love to tell it and I love to tell it to younger people because my story is the story that you do tell the younger people because it is that, you know, you go get your education, you study first and you do all these things because very few people make it to the big leagues as a player and all these things. And, you know, my, my life as a baseball player was charmed up to that point. I, I had a, a good high school career, was lucky enough to to land a scholarship to go play. And I played at UNC Charlotte and uh, life was good there, was having good success as a player. And uh, just one day I woke up and, and went from having the ability to, to throw the baseball as, as hard as my body was capable of throwing it and far as it was capable of throwing it to all of a sudden I reared back to throw it and it wouldn't go five feet. And it wasn't a ton of pain, but the reason it wasn't a ton of pain in it is because I had what back then is called an impingement, which when I threw the ball, one of the muscles made contact with the bone and got pinched. And that would cut off. It would kind of like a quick, I guess, better uh, for lack of a, a medical term for it, mm -hmm. it kind of paralyzed the arm for a second. And I just couldn't throw the ball anymore. And then when they went in to do surgery, uh, they found there was a tear in the rotator and in 1984, as a death sentence, as mm, far as right. as far as an, an athlete was, it's concerned. not like these days where you can have surgery no, and get it all fixed. If you up. have if you have rot rotator cuff surgery, which who even hears of that anymore? Mm -hmm. But if you did happen to have it, you'd be back on a throwing program within just a matter of days. Isn't that something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but but in 1984, it was a it was a death sentence. So I, I you know I was that person that was going to play, was going to play, was going to play, and hoped to play one day. Uh, in the big leagues, you never know, but you, that's the dream, right? And right. Uh, next thing you know, wake up morning and that's over. It right. was absolutely over. And, and uh, quite frankly, I didn't know, I, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And that was concerning for me, but. Uh, well, that's a good point it, because when I looked up, you're a psychology major. So what the heck do you do with that? Right. So is that true that you're a psychology major? That is correct. That is correct. See, I told you that, the, that you and I had a lot more in common. We talked to before our call <laughs> about uh, several things that we had in common, including uh, coming from a small town. But I'm also a psychology major, too. And look at what oh, I'm right. doing. So running yeah, an right? umpire <laughs> gear store. That's just the exact uh, uh, trek that you take. Right. So. Yeah. Um, so that no wonder you didn't exactly know what you were going to do. But do you know what you're going to do? Sounded like. Well, I. I on the, the when the, when our season finally ended my senior year. Uh, which is when the uh, uh, injury occurred, I didn't know what I want to do. It just so happened that my college baseball coach happened to have been a, a professional umpire for a few seasons. His name was Gary Robinson, and mm -hmm. he had made it up to double A and uh, then gave it up to come home and coach at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, where I was playing. And I just went up and sat down with him for a minute, and told him my situation, told him, you know, I didn't, I, I really don't know what I want to do. And he said, why don't you think about going down to one of the umpire schools? And uh, I said, yeah, okay. 
you know, what, 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 do you, is, um, what is yeah, umpire school? What is I, that? Yeah. How do, how do I go back and tell my dad that, you know, uh, after what he had to pay for some of my college, now I've got to go back and see if he'll uh, front me some umpire school money. <laughs> so that is, you know, didn't exactly make sense for him. But uh, so anyway, I, I looked it up. Uh, one of my teammates, I went down and sat down with him on that bus ride, told him what my thoughts were. Uh-huh. And uh, he said, I'll go with you. <laughs> and he and I went, he and I both went. Right. And sure enough, you know, the only thing I can say is we go down to umpire school, things start working out. And, you know, I'm talking to him, I'm going, and I, I'm, I'm picking this up. You picking it up. He's like, don't care. You know, it was, Whatever. it was like working, working, you go in Florida for at that time, $1,300 stay for five weeks, have three hots and a cot, you know? So it was a perfect right. situation. We took a surfboard. I'm from M in South Carolina. You think I've done a lot of surfing? So <laughs> you uh, took a surfboard to umpire school, took a surfboard to umpire school, like a real full surfboard like a surfboard it, it looked like it just looked like an ironing board to me right right did you know how to surf you no talking? no still don't know how to surf <laughs> but we took one and uh so we go down there and next thing you know both of us are in the game and, and just a little story on him he's no longer in the game but i'm sure some of the the people listening will understand remember the day that kenny rogers threw a perfect uh game with the Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers, right. Eddie Bean was the plate umpire behind the plate. He was the guy that went with me, and then he got released that year. Is that right? Yes. And he would not have gone to umpire school had it not been for you telling him the story about how you were going to go to umpire school. That's it. He would have never he would have never considered it. Now he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I, I believe he sent a couple of things from the Hall of Fame. Uh, That's great. For, That's for a great story. The you game. know what? I've got to, I, I had to try to find a picture of you um when you played baseball and um i see you've got some things on your wall there but I'm, i'll show everyone else i found a really good picture of you pitching um and let me see if i can hit my uh screen share here and show that picture how about that that is me that's you look at your look at your follow-through that's a great uh great pitching motion there i was one wonder why you had arm injuries with uh with that that arm motion. Well, if- great if, if you'll take enough pictures, one of them will come out good, right? So <laughs> they, they found one follow through that looked good. It was all the other ones that ended up wrecking the arm. So if you're just now joining us, um, you're, you're listening to MLB umpire and crew chief uh, Cubby Culbreth. We, we let the fielding name go after the first five minute discussion. Now we're, now we're just on Cubby, but uh, we're so glad to have you and, and to hear your stories about how you, you started into umpiring. Now we do have, I, I mentioned earlier that, um, and every once in a while we have a glitch and someone has pointed out a glitch. I just got a message. Let me just, let me read this to you here. Jim Reynolds has sent me a text. Yeah. Okay. This ought, this ought to be worth hearing. Text. Jim Reynolds sent me a text. He says, um, he says, we're all sitting here. All the, uh, all the uh, world series umpires are all sitting here watching, watching this. And he says that you need a translator for the call. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm going to assume this is a family program and I'm just not going to touch that other than to say that since we've been talking, I finally had to turn my phone off because everybody was calling me. Right. And I know what they want to do. You know, right. Sure. Listen, the Jim Reynolds of the world are a dime a dozen, right? Doesn't take much to be Jim Reynolds. Just go out there and call people and try to, to, uh, to give them a hard time. uh, Yeah. Try to distract them. Yeah, he sent me a message early on, and he he wanted to tell me that you looked like you're just really slim down. Well, I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, I am trying. But he I've, said he uh, wanted to know if that was if that was true or if that was the light. That's what he that's what he said. Is it the lighting? <laughs> well, like I said, if you stand somewhere long enough, there'll always be a good shot of you, right? Well, I told you you and I had a lot of comments, so there there's another 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 thing there. I think we're both we're both trying. <laughs> trying to do that so 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 power to us there yeah i just got a a picture and i'm going to try to see if i can bring this up at some point but i got a picture of uh jim reynolds he took it and he's got ted barrett sitting there and there's a, on the big screen you and i on, on the big screen you were asking yeah. earlier about how many i expect you on the call 
And uh, I told you there'd probably be, be a couple hundred, but I did not know it was going to be Ted Barrett and Jim Reynolds uh, on the call and then also harassing us all at the same time. So, well, if, if I would have known that they were going to be on or watching, I could have told you the harassment was going to come. That's the easy part. That's you knew that if anything was going to happen or not, you know, you know, that's uh, that's exactly right. He said, he said, let, let him know that we're all sitting here hanging on every word. So, so that's great. <laughs> so that's uh, so glad to get them on there. So they're um, good boys. i tell you one thing, uh, you guys watching, I love you. You know that you're good men and I appreciate every one of you. That's awesome. That's great. Um, you know, the brotherhood and umpiring is just something, you know, I know it's a, it's a, it's a difficult profession, no matter what level you do. Um, but I, you know, I, there's so much brotherhood and so much community uh, that goes into it. To me, that really outweighs all that. And I'm sure you feel the same way. No doubt about it. You know, it's, uh, uh, I don't care what I've done at any level. There's always been teammates and, and things like that, but I have never felt uh, tighter to, to people than I have in, in this industry for one reason. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lonely job. Uh, it's lonely because there's one to start with, there's only, you know, 76 of us, uh, whatever the number is, 76, 78, something like that. But the, mm -hmm. the bottom line is, you know, it's, it's, it's not a sad story, but it's you against the world. That's just the way that it is. And that's okay because we know that going in, we choose it. We're good with it. As a matter of fact, I think most of us come to embrace that part of it, that, that you are the, 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 the guy out there that's kind of the bad guy, so to speak. And we're fine with that, but you, it can't help but bring you closer to the people that share that experience with you know what it's like to be out there when the, when the chips are down. And, and, and even if you've had a, a call that didn't exactly go the way that it should have, uh, people that understand the pain, because, you know, I think most people think that, you know, uh, the umpires, they just do this, they do that. And, uh, I can assure you, I can assure you that nobody in the stands, nobody in the stands and nobody at home watching it on TV will ever be as hard on me as I'll be on me. And when I'm wrong, and I don't care that replay's there to kind of clean it up. Uh, we get paid to be right. And that's what I shoot for every single second out on that field. And, uh, and, and that comes with a whole lot of stress and a lot of uh, pressure that you put on yourself. And to be able to, 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 to talk with people like Jim and Ted and Laz Diaz and some of the people that I know uh, are involved in this thing right now, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good thing to have that kind of uh, friendship and, and they're good people. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. Um, now, when you, when you went to umpire school, I found this very interesting. You had never, um, and I know this happens, but you you had never umpired before until you got to umpire school. Is that is that a true story? That is correct. I had, uh, you know, I think like everybody, when you're uh, ten and twelve, and and uh, they make somebody go out and stand behind the mound uh, and umpire a, a half an inning because they don't have umpires to do it. I might have done that, but uh, mm -hmm. as far as anything technically, I'd never. Uh, I had never umpired a, a game in my life until I went to uh, umpire school. I, I didn't have any equipment, didn't have it. As a matter of fact, my college coach was the one that gave me a bag full of his equipment to take to umpire school. So I, I didn't have anything. Uh, I guess to be quite honest, I didn't know, I didn't know there was such a thing as professional umpires. You know, I, I certainly noticed as playing that people were umpiring and I just figured they were all local. And I guess I possibly figured the same thing, uh, not knowing any better, that that's the way it was even when I would watch a Braves game. Yeah, that's, that's something. And you went, of the umpire schools you went to, uh, you went to Joe Brinkman, the Joe Brinkman School. And I know a lot of great umpires came out of the Joe Brinkman School. Um, you know, a lot of people, we talked about Joe Brinkman. We talked about Joe Brinkman this year. We, we talked about him when um, – you know, a lot of the amateur umpires were talking about social distancing and how to umpire behind the plate and things like that. And there were some references to Joe Brinkman. And I see why you're <laughs> smiling now is because Joe liked to stand so far back from the plate. And, uh, and so, but, uh, but from an umpire school perspective, you, you go to umpire school first time, never been. And then the school is the Joe Brinkman school. Tell, tell me a little bit about Joe Brinkman from your perspective as an umpire school student and about that. Well, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what, uh, 
which one. And uh, I just, you know, looked into both. I looked into to the Wendelstadt, looked into the Breitman, and uh, really didn't find anything that jumped out at me that said do one or the other. So I just I just went to Joe's, and uh, and needless to say, I don't know how you can't fall in love with Joe uh, Brinkman and his personality right away because I still don't know to this day that I've ever met anyone that's more passionate about umpiring and the profession of umpiring at any level than Joe Brinkman. And he loves talking umpiring and mm -hmm. the philosophies of it and changing things as you, as you well know, by uh, him getting, you know, 15 feet behind the catcher, you know, <laughs> it, it was funny. He told me one time, he says, well, everybody that's yelling at me uh, from the stands told me, he said, it looks like a strike from here. So he said, I figured I'd go back there and see if they were telling the truth. <laughs> so it's a, uh, yeah, listen, I just, I loved my time at umpire school. I love being with, uh, with Joe. Cause like I said, he, he talked about it and I was very fortunate enough to, to end up instructing at his school for 10 years after being a student. And I was there actually a lot of those years with Ted Barrett and man, that is, it, it, it doesn't give you an advantage in the fact that it makes you better than everybody that doesn't. Uh, instruct but what it does it gives you five more weeks to talk around to, to sit around with people and talk nothing but baseball and umpiring and umpiring you're fortunate because you're there with some big league umpires and you get to to interact with them and and, and talk about things and uh, it was priceless it was priceless and and I, I, there's no way to this day that I don't think that it paid dividends in my chance at becoming a big league umpire yeah, that's fantastic. You know, the, um, um, you know, I had a chance to play golf with, with, uh, with Joe at one of the Ump Secure Charities um, uh, golf classics. And I was so enthused to get to play golf with him and get to pick his brain uh, about uh, what he wore back in the, you know, um, year, years before. And, and then he, he told me that story about standing far back. And he said, you know, you, you, you are safer back there. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, you know, um, did you teach that? Did they, did you, he said, no, he's, you know, of course he had his own words. He used, <laughs> yeah, you know, they wouldn't let me teach it. You know, I couldn't teach that, but uh, that's just what I did. So, uh, uh, so I, I just, I enjoyed the day of spending with him and I know we're going to, we'll talk about ump's care in, in a little bit, but I'll just go ahead and plug this now. I, there, there is no much more fun than going to a uh, ump's care golf classic and getting a chance to get to spend some time with major league umpires like yourself and getting to play a, a whole day with them. And I know the people that the first part, I mean, hey, how lucky am I? The first time I went and played at a, uh, one of the ones, the ones we sponsored years ago, I got to play with Ted Barrett first, first off. Right. So uh, you, you start with at the top there and then Tim Timmons was next. So you kind of go down a little bit, a little bit of a level, but uh, kind of, kind of, kind yeah, of. It's, yeah. it's, it's like falling off a roof. <laughs> it's, it's not kind of going down. It's, it's, <laughs> but uh, then again, I bet you uh, Ted's outfit was nice. Oh, Ted, had, he had, he's the best dressed. He's always the best dressed. I think he had. <laughs> no all doubt about it. Yeah. No doubt about it. Like Listen, was... it is, I still, I, I never missed one. I will never miss one. It is an unbelievable event. Uh, Jim Reynolds, him and his crew are some, listen, they're out there in Arizona. So they put oh, it yeah. together. And he's, I'm he's telling off you. All far and straight for sure. That, and I am, I am so proud to be a, not only a part of Ump's Care, but, uh, they that thing set up really nice and like you said you get to play with some some old time umpires and a lot of good people and it's it's a fun it's a fun day yeah it really is um you know tell me you know you 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 went to umpire school had never umpired and then next thing you know six years later you are in the big leagues you have your first game so you went to umpire school in 1987 and then uh you had your first game in 1993. I think that's the thing that's so astounding. You look at, um, you know, I know Chris Siegel got hired on full time, and you know he had been in the minors for for a long for a long time. It seems like the trend has been moving toward, you know, being you're in there longer. Um, and but you you made it in six years. That's well that's fascinating. Well, I mean, first of all, let's be clear about something. I, I wasn't full time in six right. years. Yeah, I was working in the big leagues in six years, and then was yeah. fortunate by and large, to, to umpire very few games in the minor leagues from that point on. But I was still quite a few years before I came uh, part of the full-time full staff. Time. But I, you know what? It's, uh, 
it, it, I, it's like any other job. I, first of all, I think you do have to be able to do your job. But second of all, a lot of it's just a circumstance. You know, there had to be an opening. There had to be a chance to advance. There had to be uh, somebody in the stands to see you. And, and there had to be a, a situation that possibly came up that, that stood out. So, you know, I'd love to sit here and tell you the reason I made it in six years mm -hmm. is because I'm just that much better than Jim Reynolds, you know, which I am. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, right. I didn't. Yeah. I mean, if they're going to watch, I'm going to give it back. Right? That's right. But, but, uh, you heard it here. You heard it here. Um, uh, Cubby, <laughs> Cubby says he's a better on par than Jim Reynolds. So yeah, that's exactly right. And I'll stand it. behind it's those official. words. It's but it's, news. uh, you know, I'd love to sit here and tell you it's, it's all about that, but it's not. It takes, far more uh, there's far more involvement than that and, and again it, uh, it's it's a lot of skill and an awful lot of luck as well and and all those things fell on my side and and I was fortunate enough to uh six years into this thing be working some games in the big leagues and uh it's just how fortunate am I you know I've, I've been blessed I'd say one of the most interesting stories uh about you that I did not know until today is that you actually had the the number 42 that was your umpire number right but now it's 25 i i, I think people would be, would be really interested in knowing how your number changed from 42 to 25. well it's, it's kind of a funny and scary story at the same time too uh you know I, i'd love to tell everybody that i asked for that number and and that i was dedicating it to uh, Jackie Robinson and all this kind of stuff, but that's not true. They assigned it to me. They right. just gave me the number. And right and, uh, and you, at that time, you didn't say, "Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it unless you give me the the number I pitch with at UNC Charlotte." Right? So <laughs> no, I, I, pretty much, I, I pretty much took the jersey and the number they gave me. So uh, so they gave me number forty two, and uh, uh, you know, I I don't I don't think that much of that at that time because it's just a number there's a lot of people wearing number 42 right right but uh or it's not soon after that the phone rings one day and i'm thinking oh lord i don't ever get calls from the bosses right i'm thinking i didn't get started in this thing good and i'm about to get fired already and what it was is they were calling me to tell me that they were uh, doing a uh, system-wide retirement of number 42 they were going to grandfather in the players but uh, they weren't going to grandfather me in. But the reason they weren't is because umpires, because of our longevity in the game, uh, they wanted it to soon be just that number out there. And I understood right. it and right. I was fine with it, but uh, uh -huh. that's how I got it. And, and uh, there's no specialty to 25. Uh, I just, you know, you just take what's out there. Sure. And, uh, but that's how the, the number 42 came about. So you're the last umpire, and I assume the last umpire ever to wear number 42 on your sleeve because of Jackie Robinson. That is correct. I yeah, mean, everybody a... everybody wears it for a day every year, but uh, uh -huh. but at one time I had it on there right. for for uh, for a full season and everything like that. So it's I it's think a, that's a great story. I love that. It story. is. It is yeah. good. Yeah. So. Um, so another another thing I want to talk to you about is there there are some games that that you that you were in that I'm really interested to know your perspective of. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, you show up for a game one day and uh, Cal Ripken has his streak going of what two thousand six hundred and so many games and Cal Ripken is not playing shortstop. Did yeah, you know that, that was before uh, that before the game. Did they did they tell you that was no. going to happen? Did they prepare you anyway? Did you? There was there was nothing that would have given uh, anybody in, any uh, indication that Cal wasn't going to play. We walk up to the uh, plate just like we always do. the The only thing that didn't make any sense is uh, you know they, the the Orioles were playing the Yankees, and it was the last game. If I remember correctly, it was the last game of the series. Mm -hmm. It's on a Sunday. And yeah. It's yeah. It's on a Sunday. And I noticed that both managers brought the lineup cards out, which is rare. They'll usually do it on the, the uh, first day of the series, if they do it then. And uh, then they just send somebody out the next couple of days. But they both came up. And, um, you know, I, I noticed that, but I still didn't think anything about it. I, you know, maybe they're just going to say hello and goodbye to one another and make small talk. But 
you know, we're standing there and Greg Kosk uh, has the plate and I noticed all of a sudden that, that his eyes just got big as saucers. And immediately I knew what was going on. And sure enough, that was the night that Cal decided that he wasn't going to play. Mm-hmm. And they played a game in Baltimore without Cal Ripken on the field out of, you know, you know, the number, I'm sorry that I don't, but, right, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. but it, it was the first time in that many games that Cal Ripken didn't take the field. And, 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 you know, I feel like every night on a uh, major league baseball field is history. Cause I mean, you know, some of the plays we see, mm-hmm. some of the things we see and the things that take place is history within itself, but then there's special moments that just really stand out and, and uh, that was special. And, and quite frankly, I think of all the, the records that are in sports in general, and I have a hard time believing that will ever oh, be yeah. broken because between longevity mm-hmm. and then you talk about just having the fortunate and good luck and being blessed to just, Lord, not having a sore ankle one day, much less a broken ankle or mm-hmm. something that, that really takes you off the field. So that's an amazing thing that happened. Uh, I'll be surprised if it's ever broken. I know that they're out there to be broken, but uh, it was certainly, uh, it was exciting to be out there and be a part of that. And you also, um, as speaking of Cal Ripken, you were also on the field for his 3000th hit as well. So there's a lot of history between you and Cal Ripken there. Well, I make Cal what he is. If you'll, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you, I mean, right. you know, I, I got him, I, hey, I made him a, I made him a pretty good living in baseball. Yeah, no, maybe that's was, why he decided to take off that one day. He had a three thousand hit with you and thought, "I'm going to make this a a, <laughs> you know, a cuppy thing." And uh, that's right. Uh, this will be the day. Uh, he's 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 already had his time on the field with me. He's had his moments and and it not was it, records today. It's just one of those strange things that you know a couple of big events because you know face it, there's only a handful of people that have gotten three thousand hits in a career and. And to, to be on the field with the day that the streak came to an end and and then there for the uh, 3,000 hit, uh, man, the odds aren't real good that that'll happen in anybody's career. So, Well, I'll was, tell you what, uh, what I really like hearing from you today, and I hope that all the people who are watching really get a sense of, is is how all the – you just embody all the positive that comes with umpire. We talked earlier about the brotherhood and, and the community, but I'm also hearing basically that you have the best seat in the house. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, uh, there's nights that that seat's not very comfortable, but it's still the best seat in the house. And uh, <laughs> that's a really good line. It's the well, best seat. It's not always comfortable, but it's the best seat. Yeah, I, I sometimes like that. you th- it's, sometimes you think it's lined with nails, but right. uh, it's it, it is. It's listen. I what have I got to complain about? You know, I've 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 been in Major League Baseball for for going on, you know, 20 something years. And how can you find anything negative about that? And uh, so every night walking out there is it's it's a treat and it's a it's a blessing. And I, I truly mean that, you know, that's they're not always beautiful nights. And some of them get long and some of them get this and some of them get whatever. But I, I don't think that I've ever not appreciated every single one of them, you know, because it's uh you know, it's, 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 uh, I mean, it's the big leagues. I, it, how does it get any better than that? How can you find anything negative to say about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And if you're just tuning in, uh, we are here, we're on the dish, on guitar.com's dish, uh, Facebook live with, uh, Cubby Culbreth, um, uh, umpire crew chief, uh, major league baseball. And he's, uh, telling us about his career, how he got into umpiring and we're sharing some stories and we you know one of the stories and talking about having the best seat in the house and there's something about third base because you were at third base when uh the day cal um uh his last game but there was another game that was uh of all you know you you did three world series you've done seven or eight uh can't keep up uh league championship series um but but there was one game that you were you were in in at third base that was significant and that was the game uh i guess what they refer to now as the bartman game uh, in Chicago. So Miami's playing Chicago. It's game six. And um, I can't remember exactly who was hitting, uh, but uh, hit the left field. Uh, Moises Alou uh, goes to get it, gets his glove into the stands. And um, a Cubs fan by the name of Steve Bartman uh, put his hands out and interfered uh, with the ball. Uh, Mike Everett was in left field and <coughs> the call. 
to um, to call interference on that. And um, Cubby was uh, was at third base. Tell us about that call and um, and and what you was going through your head during during that time, uh, and any insights you have on that. Well, actually, I was in I was in left field, and Mike Everett was at, at third base. But uh, you know, when it was hit, just another foul ball, right? It looks like it's going to be a foul ball. It's going to be close enough to go over there and check it and do all those kind of things. And uh, needless to say, as it's coming down and coming down, it gets closer and closer and closer where you realize that this could have some potential for fan interference and different things like that. But, but ultimately it was definitely in the stands. And uh, from my perspective, that man did what every single person in that ballpark right. not only did would, would do if they have a chance tomorrow night, but have done for, 150 years, right? The, the ball comes to them, they try to catch it. And um, man, it was so, it, it blew up and became uh, unfortunate because it seemed, or it was, I guess it was a big deal depending on how you look at it. But the thing is, I can tell you from my perspective, and this is just, you know, it's, it's not something I talk about too often, but I do not, I'm not, I'm not one of the people that believes that the ball would have just necessarily been caught. Mm. If he didn't do anything, that ball was not just where a Lou could have just reached mm. and got it. You saw right. him, he had to leap and mm. he would have had to leap. And, and I can tell you this, uh, there was more set of arms than just Bartman's. Just the Bartman's. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just so happened that he's the final guy that, that actually, I guess, made contact with it and that ends up having to carry this round for the rest of his life. But, um, you know, I've told anybody that will listen, I, I don't think that it necessarily would have been caught because mm -hmm. it was, it just wasn't an easy play because of the right. wall and everything at, uh, at uh, Wrigley. You'd have to, you know, where it starts to go up and uh, could he have had a chance? Yes. Uh, but, but I don't know, I don't know that whether they touch it or not, that he, uh, that he makes that play, but I can tell you that everything that has mm -hmm. come with it since yeah. has been, you know, a, a, a part of history that changed lives. And, and I've, I've told people many times that if, if anybody in this world, because, you know, I tell my wife that even she doesn't know what it's like to be a major league umpire, even though she lives with one, because until you walk out there and you feel that pressure and then it's coming down on you, there's no way that you can truly understand it. I can describe it all day long, but you can't understand right. it until you do it. And I say that about everybody in this uh, world other than Steve Bartman. He knows. He knows exactly how it feels to, to feel like everybody in the world is staring at you. Mm -hmm. Everybody's staring at you because it's not good and it's a whole lot of hate involved in it at the time and a whole lot of, and when I say hate, I don't mean hate and, you know, let's go get the guy. I mean, hate and, you know, passionate sports people, you know, but there's a man, if, if eyes could kill, right. that's, he, he knows it. Steve Bartman, I could sit down and talk to him for a minute yeah. and he and I, we could, we could understand a few things and he'd get oh, wow. some of what I'm talking about where most people they're not capable of understanding that because they just haven't been looked at and heard that kind of noise raining down on you. So, man, it was unfortunate, but, you know, I still always go back, you know, and we can slice this thing up a thousand ways, but if I'm correct, the very, the very next pitch or the very next batter, I can't remember which one, but there was a two bouncer hit to an all-star shortstop that right. was waist high and he booted it for right. the same out that they thought that a Lou would have had. And people don't remember that. So exactly. you've got this guy that's making good money playing the shortstop and he boots the ball. Whereas the school teacher sitting out in left field makes the play. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he's the one that, that, that gets remembered. That's uh that's crazy to me, but right. hey, it's, and not goes. to mention, not to mention, Chicago had a chance to win it in Game Seven, and 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 didn't yeah. get a chance to do that there. So yeah, there's a yeah. lot of things that uh, I guess it's a lot. It, you know, it's really interesting what hearing your story and your perspective about this, that the, the Steve Bartman about that game and about Steve Bartman. Basically, what I'm hearing from you is there's a lot of um, 
similarities between what Steve Bartman went through um, and what umpires go through. That that there's, pressure and uh, and when there's a when you do make a mistake and you, you you're the one that you you mentioned earlier you talked about how there's no one that is more um, you know upset with themselves over a mistake than 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 uh, than yourself on the field and um, that's a I really can't imagine perspective. I can't imagine uh, sitting there in the stands like he was because mm-hmm. I can tell you that on the field we're sitting out there in between the innings you'll see us talk from time to time and everything's good and relaxed because up to that point, it's just been a baseball game. Everything's being decided by the players, the balls, strike safes and outs and all those things are taking care of themselves. And next thing, you know, you have a play that, that doesn't, you know, uh, next thing, you know, you're in the middle of it as an umpire. And, and they're, again, the booze are raining down on you, all these kind of things. And whether you're right or wrong is insignificant. There's a whole lot on you at that very second. Whereas just a few minutes ago, Life was just as good as it could be because, as you say, we you know we got the best seat in the house. You're enjoying a good uh, 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 major league baseball game, and I would imagine that's what he was feeling. He's sitting there and he's uh, having a uh, maybe a beer and some peanuts, and next thing you know, here comes the ball. He mm-hmm. he is that year's story. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I know exactly how he feels. I know one hundred percent how he feels. And, uh, and I, and I can tell you that I personally hurt for that guy. It bothered me. It, it, it bothered me because, you know, I'm I'm sitting there watching this guy that's just, he's trying his best to, um, to take it all in, wonder what's happening. What did he do? What could he have done? And, and wondering what creature can help him melt into that Mm -hmm. chair and just go away. right? Right. And that's just not how it goes. You're there, you do it, you got to take ownership for it and move on. But here's my thing, and I'll leave it at this. To this person that was at that game, Steve Bartman didn't have anything to do with anything other than trying to catch a foul ball. I love it. I tell you what, this might be one of the the baseball fan stories of of this conversation is that, uh, you know, out of this conversation, Cubby, um, uh, Major League umpire, uh, Cubby Culberth empath- empathizes with, uh, with with Steve Bartman, and uh, I know he to this day, you know, doesn't give interviews and doesn't talk about it. And uh, uh, but obviously, um, you know, you feel the way you feel. That's really interesting. Obviously, the call was right, right? We don't we don't have to discuss that now. Nah. Mike Everett has retired, so you can you could uh, tell him that it was wrong, but you're not going to. You, you, I know you admitted tonight that you're better than Jim Reynolds as an umpire, but I, that's probably one. Uh, that's probably the only major uh, thing we want to, you know share tonight but that call was right right he got the call right that's interference. there's there's no doubt that ball was that ball was in the stands there's uh uh it's that's really even never been disputed mm-hmm. uh, the ball was definitely in the stands uh so yeah it was just uh just one of those things and and uh you know uh, to this day i hate it i've seen the 30 30 thing or whatever they sure. have and, yeah. mm-hmm. and uh you know it, it it still hurts it still hurts mm-hmm. to watch him uh, to this day, but again, well, I'll tell you, know, you what, let's, um, let's spend time. If Jim Reynolds is giving you a hard time tonight, uh, if you all don't know on the call, uh, Jim Reynolds, uh, basically sent me a text and told me that we needed a translator. Now, the thing that I don't know though, Cubby, he may not have been talking about you. Don't assume it was about you. You know, I'm from Eastern Kentucky. So, and you're from, uh, you know, Northwest, um, South Carolina. So who knows who he was talking about? Maybe he needs a translator for both of us. So, but, you know, let's let's share a story. I heard a story about you and Jim Reynolds and Paul Emmel on a fishing trip in the minors. I, I want to hear that story. Well, first of all, the, you know, the reason Jim's going to tell you that that uh, that I need a translator is because, you know, Jim's from Connecticut, which, you know, inherently makes him one of the, the 10 smartest people in the world. <laughs> so anyway, we won't, let's not get too deep into that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so we're going to go fishing. We have an off day in the, uh, in the minor leagues, and um, we're all working together, and, and you know, we're going to go fishing. And let's just say that, you know, the only thing Jim knows about fishing is that they don't start in the boat. They're down in the water somewhere, but he doesn't understand the whole concept, okay? And Paul's evidently not done much of it himself, which baffles me that I'm in – a boat with two grown men 
that don't know anything about fishing. But anyway, again, we could go on that forever. So anyway, I just tell them, I said, guys, here's the thing. I put them in, we're fishing for striper and striper is a schooling fish. And when certain times of year when they school, well, the only thing you got to do, and this is what I tell them, if you can get the hook in the water, you will catch a fish. Right. I tell them, that's the only thing you got to do. Get the hook in the water. Bam. Jim cast, and I think he hits the, the boat chair, maybe the motor, so it doesn't make it to the water. Okay. Paul, you know, I don't, I'm not too sure that uh, Emil didn't throw the rod in the, the lake. So they can't get the hook in the water. And I just tell them, I said, boys, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw it in there. I'm going to catch two. Okay. And I cast out there and sure enough, when I reeled it in, I had two fish, I had two fish on one hook. I was using a treble hook and had two fish on it. So <laughs> not only, not only am I a better umpire than Jim Reynolds, I'm right. 10 times the fisherman. 10 times better fisherman. Oh man. What, that is so funny because, uh, you know, Paul, uh, talking to Paul uh, about this story, he told me, he told it different. He said that they threw their line in the water. Uh, Jim caught one right off the bat. And then Paul caught one right off the bat. And you got mad because you are the 10 time better fisherman, but you weren't catching any yet. And so they were really having a fun time with you because they were catching and you weren't. But then you eventually won up them with uh, um, two fish on one on one hook. The only thing I exactly what the story what the, exactly the story is. So, um, the, but you you the, won up them no matter no matter what how you got there. Well, the only thing I can say to that is that's the reason they call them fish stories, fishing stories. You know, <laughs> everybody gets to tell it the way they want to tell it. The only thing is, and if he, I I wish there was some way that that somebody could see his face right now. Because I guarantee he's looking down in his lap because he's ashamed he's, of himself. He's not texting me. He's not texting me <laughs> since, since since the uh, since that comment. So. No, it was it was one of those. It was it was one of those beautiful things. And sure enough, I did. I had two uh, two fish on one hook. You, you know, one thing I want to make sure I do, I do not forget to ask tonight. There's two two things about umpiring that I want to ask. Um, and one one of them is what's what's the difference um, in umpiring uh, in the in the in the majors as an umpire, but then when you become a crew chief, and I think the same year you became a crew chief. I also think you were in really good company. I think Ted Barrett, Jim Joyce became crew chiefs. I want to say that was uh, what 2013, circa around then. Yeah. Um, what changes when when someone is a major league umpire and then, then the next year they are the they are a full time crew chief? What's different? Well, there's a lot of things that change, um, you know, in the big scheme of things, nothing changes drastically because at the end of the day, you know, I'm still a firm believer that whether you're the crew chief or the number four guy and the number four guy, the way we have them set up is just a guy that's the, the lowest in seniority. Okay. But I always look at it that, you know, one, you're all big league umpires, you know, you all made it, you're all grown men. Uh, you certainly have the skill set to be there. You wouldn't have been there. So I think most of it, or at least the way that I try to lead the crew is, is I leave it alone and just one, try to make sure that I don't try to lead. I just try to lead by example, which is make sure that they see that I'm going to work as hard as anybody. And if that's the case, then they ought to be as well. Um, uh, the thing that comes with it as far as, the responsibilities, that's what changes, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, anything that, that takes place, you're the, you're the bottom line, you're where the buck stops and it's going to be your name that's set with it. And uh, whether that be good or bad, because ultimately there's a decision that's got to be made. Uh, you're going to have a big part of, uh, of how that goes down. And um, you know, that's where, that's where the responsibility comes in. You know, you, you're pulling teams off the field for rain situations. You're putting them back on the field in rain situations. And these are all big decisions because there's a, you know, there's a lot on the line. There's the game itself. There's the people in the stands. If it's not an official game yet, which is a lot of money, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of decisions that give you a lot of re uh, responsibility. And again, at the end of the day, you're responsible for, for how that, uh, that thing turns out. And, 
And, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, everything runs itself and is good. But just like I had right after becoming a crew chief, had a situation in Houston where I made a bad decision on a ruling. There had been some rules changes, and I made a mistake. You know, I made a mistake. It wasn't initially my call, but ultimately, I'm the one that came up with, uh, with the decision that we were going to go with. And I made a mistake and uh, it's something that you live with. And it's also something that I take on ownership of. I'm not, uh, I'm not ashamed of being wrong. I don't ever uh, want to be wrong, but um, you know, I, it's, it's, it's just part of everything that comes along in life. And that day I was the man in charge and I didn't make a good decision, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's I'm, I'm, the part. You know, just to, just to defend, I make bad decisions all the time too. So, uh, uh, so you're not the only one for sure uh, on that. And uh, you know, we all make decisions. I, I, I've heard good things about how you know, um, you know, no one goes to some just someone's random workplace and when they make a mistake, <laughs> you know, they get yelled at. Right? That's not that's not right. common. No, nobody yells at me uh, for the mistakes that I make. But uh, but but like you. Um, when I make one, there's no one who's more, uh, you know, uh, bothered by the mistake than myself. Oh, and that's, and that's, that's the part that changed as a crew chief, you know, uh, you know, in the, in all the years before that, if I made a mistake, I beat myself up and, and I found a way to pick myself back up and then went on about business. But now all of a sudden it, it, it takes on a whole different meaning when you're the guy that's in charge of, mm. of coming up with the final say. And, uh, you know, when that happens, uh, 90, again, 99.9% .9 of the time, we come up with the right decision. Uh, that day I, I fell short of that. And uh, that's what, that's part of what comes with being a crew chief. And, uh, you know, hate it, but it, it happened and you move on and, and, and learn from it. And, and I think that it's all those things that, that make you better at what you do. And uh, I think that, uh, I've become a better crew chief since then, you know, no doubt, no doubt, you know, and that's something we, we teach and I talk about, you know, here at the office, when people make mistakes, um, it's the way you, it's, it's how you build experience. You don't build experience just by learning it in a rule book or in the policy manual. Um, you learn by experience. And, um, and so obviously you've done a lot of things right in your career to be able to um, become a crew chief at major league baseball. Um, and then also to work three World Series. What's the difference between umpiring during the regular season and then having a playoff game of that magnitude? Hmm. Once again, that's, that's kind of one of those things that's, it's tough to explain. I, I guess the best way to do it is our season is kind of broken up into, uh, we talk about it as umpires, three or four different seasons. And it'll make sense when we talk about, you know, their spring training. Spring training is fun. It's relaxed. It's, it's baseball back at its youth finest, right? You know, the fans are closer. Uh, everybody's happy. It's a new season. And then you start the season. So everybody, you turn that dial up just a little bit and you start there. And, you know, you go through that for a couple of months and then you get close to the all-star break. They turn up the, the volume uh, again a little bit as far as intensity and stuff like that. And then after the all-star break, you know, you get to that, you know, three quarters of the, the season. And now some teams have maybe played themselves into a position to be in the running. Some have played themselves out. And there's, there's that. There's teams that are, uh, you know, still working hard to get in the playoffs. And that becomes a little bit more intense, right? Because now games matter. Not that they don't matter the first day because they matter every day. Mm -hmm. But now we're getting closer to the finish line. So there's less room for error for anybody on the field, right? So then you get down to the end of the season where every game matters with anybody that's in contention. And you could cut the tension with a knife uh, as far as the – fan electricity, the players, everybody, the umpires and the way they're feeling. And then you go to the playoffs and the playoffs are the reason you're seeing a whole lot of shine here where hair should have been because it's, uh, there's, it's, it's intense. It's very intense. And, uh, it's, uh, 
it's a new season. It's a new season for the fans. It's a new season for the players. It's, it's all hope now. I mean, they've made it to, they've separated themselves from everybody in the game and there's this many teams left. And now one of these, two of these teams are going to be playing in the world series when this thing's all said and done this little tournament. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's intense and it is a lot of pressure. Uh, especially for baseball, especially the further you get along into the, uh, the playoff season, because uh, we're one of the only sports that once we get to that part of the, uh, the year, we become kind of the only thing left in town, mm. you know, because of, uh, you know, basketball is done with, hockey's mm -hmm. done with, get ready to start back up, right. done with. So you're the only thing left in town. And it's, it's, man, it's a, uh, it's the it's big stage and the only stage, right? It is, it is unbelievable. But at the same time, it is everything you've worked for. It is everything you've dreamed of. And, you know, anybody that I talk to when I talk to younger uh, umpires about it, I tell them, don't let it get too big on you because I can tell you, you're ready for it. You just don't know it, but you're ready for it because you've got thousands of games under your belt. And at the end of the day, they're going to throw that baseball at that plate, just like they have in those other thousands. No, nothing changes. Right. It's just it's just right. what you do to yourself, and it's the same way for the players. Uh -huh. It's you know you you listen to them talk about it. They're not going to describe it much difference. It's the pressure that you put on yourself. It's not the pressure that everybody else necessarily puts on you because we deal with that every single day of the year, and and, uh, yeah. and don't let it phase you. So ultimately, it's what you do to yourself, and it's a it's a uh, it's a weird thing to try to fight through, but uh, you do it. And you survive it, and uh, it is, it is when you walk off the field when when those series are over, uh, it's tough to describe the elation and everything that mm -hmm. you feel from uh, from one being done and two knowing that you did a good job and and you say you did a good job because the team that's advancing on and the team that's going home, uh, it's happening because of what they did, not the, and and not something that you had uh, any part of. Well, I tell you what, I love the perspective that you painted there with the intensity dialing up as the season progresses from spring training to regular season to playoffs to World Series, that it's a dial that just keeps turning up as yeah. the year progresses. And, you know, I'm sure to some extent, you know, you see that at all levels of baseball. And uh, those of you who are watching, I know we have a lot of, um, you know, umpires at all levels watching um, um, and listening in to uh, Major League Umpire and Crew Chief. Uh, Cubby Colbert here on the dish at umpire.com. And uh, I'm sure they, they see a lot of the same things where things heat up uh, during the year, not, not only from the intensity, but, uh, you know, also you, you see, seem to see a lot of ejections in July and August. That's not just because of the heat. It, it doesn't sound like it's uh, there's, there's more, more variables going on there. So, um, you know, speaking of all uh, strikes uh, and outs being the same, no matter whether you're, you're in regular season or you're in the, uh, the playoffs, you have a very unique third strike call those of you who don't know right your third strike call you i don't know there, there's so many have have their unique call and that's one thing that's different from uh, uh baseball and softball is you know you can have your own a little bit of flair tell us a little bit about your um uh the evolution of it, where that came came about you know i wish i could uh, put a date and time and all that stuff on it but the truth is I really don't, and, and I can't even describe because I didn't always do that. Uh, it just kind of came about over time, and uh, I can also tell you that with time, it's starting to go down a little bit because I can't get my leg up as high as I, <laughs> I could when I was uh, 30. I found a picture here, so this, uh, those of you who don't know, you see you see this here, so uh, hey, that, that legs up pretty good there, there, Cubby. It's, that's at least 90 degrees there on that, so. Uh, that must have been, that must have been 20 years ago. That was that older, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, it, now it comes up just above my calf, so, no, it's, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, it's just, just something... it's just something that, that evolved, and, and that became my thing, and, and uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just it's just kind of what I do. I always love it when people say, "Hey, can you 
show us your strike three call. And you, you could be in a restaurant and you go, no, <laughs> why would I do that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, I believe people think that, that not only do you sit around working on that, right. but you just love showing it to people as well. But uh, Yeah, right. No, you just love doing it, it whenever, right? That, no, I just yeah. I just do it. And as a matter of fact, yeah. if the only thing you got to do is go look at some game field. I love doing it so much. I've done it probably about 10 times in my career on strike two. So <laughs> <laughs> that happens as well. It happens sure. every, from time yeah, to time. Every once in a while. Um, you know, speaking of signature <laughs> things, you know, we're obviously, you know, um, you know, I'm the owner of umpatire.com and, and we sell umpire gear um, uh, all across the world. And I am as much of, a, of an umpire gear uh, aficionado <laughs> as anyone uh, and love talking about umpire gear. And, uh, and we've been on the, on the call tonight hearing about your career and I, I've loved hearing it. And I know that everyone else, we've had a lot of people on the call tonight. A lot of people are staying on the call. Thank you all so much for joining in and listening to us. Uh, and we're, I'm loving hearing that you're about your career and your stories. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about umpire gear and about maybe some of the evolution of what you wore before and what you uh, wear now and maybe the reasons for some of that change. Well, it's, it's funny. Uh, you know, I told you early on that I got a big bag of umpire gear to, uh, to take to umpire school uh, from my coach. And it had, it was a bag full of uh, plus pause stuff. If you remember back when sure. plus pause, I don't, I, I don't know who bought them out. I don't know uh, if they're, for all I know, they're still making some product. I don't think so. I think they've been gone for a, a while. Correct. No, plus uh, pause is still around. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the sun is, is running a smaller version of what it was in the past. Okay. Of course, plus pause back in the day, you know, us knowing, uh, no, being the official supplier of minor league baseball, I knew, I knew at one time they were the official supplier of minor league baseball back in the day. And I'm assuming that's where you're headed with this, that, um, plus pause was, if you didn't have plus pause, you didn't have anything, right. There was a, a guy, Carlucci, uh, that was out in California. He made, he made, um, uh, handcrafted stuff for uh, certain individuals, but man, as a minor leaguer, minor leaguer, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't afford that. So I had this bag full of uh, plus pause stuff and I put it on an award and it was, it was great. Right. And, uh, and uh, you know, didn't know any better. And I'm traveling around getting hit in the knees and the chest and, and uh, everywhere else. And, you know, it hurts at times because you feel like it's, it's a baseball. It's going, you know, 95 to hundred miles an hour. It ought to hurt. And uh, I wore that stuff. I wore it and I was still wearing it in the big leagues when I first got there, okay? And it had already, there's no telling how many years old it was. Sure. So finally I take a shot in the knee one night and I go, that's enough of that. There's gotta be something that I, you know, I'm just gonna get a, a new set of stuff. Well, so I wore that. Then I went to the uh, Wilson. I went to Wilson Shin Guards and Wilson uh, chest protector. And I didn't realize that you didn't have to hurt until I put that stuff on. So I fell in love with the Wilson chest protector and the Wilson shin guards. Uh, and I wear the gray stuff, you know, they're gray and right. blue. Yeah. Uh, I wear the gray. Yeah. I love it. I swear by it. Uh, it it's uh, for me, it is the right amount of protection uh, without being overly bulky and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, as far as a face mask, uh, I use the uh, all-star eye bar mm -hmm. and, uh, and had a, I like it because it's just, for me, it's got the biggest, uh, uh, the, the most open view. And, and I certainly need that. If I'm going to be better than Jim Reynolds, I need the best look. That's what got you there. That's exactly right. I got a better right. look at the field than Jim Reynolds does. See, Jim's right. looking, I don't know what Jim's looking through, but it's not an eye bar. Right. But uh, anyway, so that's what I uh, use there. I used, uh, uh, what else? Everybody makes fun of me. I, I will tell you one thing, you know, every year they send us uh, ball bags. And uh, I have decided because of my coach giving me that equipment, right? So he gave me all that equipment out of the goodness of his heart. I took it, used it until it was just ragged, except for the ball bag. And, you know, it's all been gone, but I'm still using the same ball bag today that I used the first game that I ever umpired in my life. 
Uh, it will go with me to the end. It's got 101 patches on it. It's been sewn up and Is stitched. Is that right? And it's uh, whatever. I don't know what color you would call it, but it's not blue uh, <laughs> because it's been faded by the sun. It's, right. Uh, it's got, you know, my mother has stitched it up. I've stitched it up. Everybody, I've even had uh, catchers, players just turn around and go, man, what's the deal with that? bag you got there and then i tell them you go oh that's cool but up until that point right right they're like why in the world would you be caught dead with that nasty looking thing I'd at least throw it in the washing machine or something but uh that thing came with me uh and in honor of my coach it's going to leave with me as well so i, I, I can definitely respect that yeah everything in my uh that. everything in my umpiring career equipment wise has changed over the years but uh but the ball bag isn't that something I love that story. Um, I know, you know, uh, you know, umpire, I've really found that, um, you know, we, when we supply uh, sports, we you know we don't do just do umpires. We do, you know, all kinds of sports, uh, yeah. basketball and football and those kind of things, but man, it is umpires. And it's not, you know, no offense to any softball umpires, but the baseball umpires are the one that are just um, uh, have a lot of sentimental value to their gear. Right. And so, you know, someone has a great year. Maybe they get uh, the playoff games that they want and uh, they get superstitious just like players do. I know I played uh, played ball and I was extremely superstitious about things. I would always put my socks on the same way every every game and those kind of things. And uh, and I can really appreciate how much love uh, umpires have for their mask and their, and their chest protectors and their shin guards. Um, a, and it sounds like that's a, the same thing for you as well. It's a, listen, it's a big deal. Um, and it's a big deal, uh, not only for the comfort and the uh, confidence that you have sitting behind this catcher and, and doing everything. Uh, listen, a, a, a baseball traveling at 100 miles an hour makes quite an impression on you when it hits you. And uh, if, if you don't have the proper attire, uh, man, it could lead to a Sure. some bad injuries and, mm -hmm. and, uh, sure. and you, you just can't, you can't do that over the course of a season and certainly can't do it over a, a course of a career. So equipment's in, it's important. And, and the big thing that I found out that I wasn't aware of early is you can't let it get so old that it doesn't do its job anymore. Mm -hmm. There comes a point you can get another pair of the same stuff. Cause that's what we do, right? That's just what you were talking about, but you can't, you can't just take a pair of shin guards and wear them for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Cause at some point that padding, just like anything else between sweating and getting wet and then drying, you're going to have dry rot. You're going to have different things. It's going to take away some of the integrity and you're going to start filling shots. You quite frankly, you shouldn't feel anymore. So, you know, you have to invest in your health out there. And the best way to do that is, is realize that every now and then, you're going to have to take some of those game fees and go out there and, and, and change your equipment, you know? So that's a, I know it's a, at the amateur level, especially the lower amateur where you're, you're not making a lot of money doing it. It feels like if you do that, you've got to work 40 games before you just break an even, but I'm telling you, it's worth it in the, the long haul because, you know, if you, if you're out there with a busted knee or a broken elbow, you're not going to be working either. You're not going to be making any money. Um, no there yeah. so there's got to be a, a a good balance there and you know i appreciate you saying that i know that you mentioned earlier that um you know you you wore that plus pause gear for a long time and i don't i think just to clarify for those watching i don't think cubby was saying anything bad per se about plus pause he was talking Absolutely about not. how the many years of wearing wearing that it's it's going to uh, lose as you mentioned the word you mentioned was integrity over time so so an older model of and it could be anything it could be an older model of wilson for example it's not going to have the same protective ability over a long ever a longer period of time as as something newer i can assure you that uh that that it had nothing to do with plus pods because like i said back in the day if you didn't have plus pods you didn't have anything it was and that was the top of the line Absolutely. Uh, gear. So I can assure it wasn't that. It was the fact that I didn't realize that you needed to change this stuff out. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I, I would, you know, I don't want anybody else uh, making those mistakes. We didn't change mm -hmm. out. I didn't change out face masks until they got bent up so much that you couldn't see through them. And you umpired like Jim Reynolds. So uh, <laughs> Jim, you know, Jim. Hey, the, Jim's <laughs> learned a valuable lesson tonight. Do not harass Cubby on a Zoom call. Because now he, can, now he, he has can, the power. He has. He now has the platform. 
Uh, he can he can harass all he wants, but he better be prepared for what comes with that harassment. That's all. And uh, but no, I mean you know again, it's, equipment's no different than going out there and uh, and and seeing balls and strikes and safes and outs. It takes a years years and years worth of experience to get really good at it. Well, it, it takes getting hit a few times to realize my equipment needs to be updated and needs to be whatever. Maybe I need to look at something else. So listen, you know, that's a good point that you mentioned that. And you hear that sometimes out of people who might wear something and they may say, well, you know what? I didn't get injured by that, but it really did hurt. So I'm, so I'm going to stick with yes. what I've got. You're, you're recommending it. It's okay to, to wear things that where you're, there's no, there's no hurt at all. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and, and, you know, I don't think you have to go out and just get, all of this uh, brand or all of that brand or all of anything you find, you find what works for you and, uh, and get back there and, and, and have the confidence that you're going to be healthy and, and able to do that uh, game with knowing that you're going to get hit from time to time, but you're going to be okay. And, and, and that's a big deal. I mean, again, Were you're you sitting- wearing, well, I'm going to ask you which, specific, specifically because the, the umpire gear market has really changed, especially in chest protectors to wear, uh, for the baseball umpires that everything is now a hard shell. You know, yeah. when, when I first got into this in 2006, uh, it was half everything was soft shell and half everything was hard shell. And so we were even at a time selling some of those ribbed chest protectors that were like the catcher. So there was no hard shell, not even inside. Yes. So was that something that you were wearing at some point? You were wearing something that was more of a soft shell and the, minors and even in the well, that's, in starting that's, majors? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. When when uh, when I was using all the stuff that was given to me, the plus pause, that's again, that's that was my stupidity. It wasn't plus pause right. at the time. Like I said, yeah. that was as good as the stuff there was out there. But it, it, there was no plastic at the time. Right. Or, or yeah. the armor. Or, uh, right. So, yes, it was the softer stuff. Wow. And uh, and you felt it a whole lot more. And that's when, uh, you know, you start when people started making upgrades to the equipment. I didn't evolve with that right away, mm-hmm. you know? So that's Have only you really noticed a discernible difference in the, you know, miles per hour of these pitchers these days. And do you, do you, is that something that has, it seems like it's just evolved in the last few years. I recall you, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big Reds fan grown, grown up uh, following the big red machine. And of course, when a role Chapman came on the scene and he was throwing over a hundred, we were just all, um, you know, that's just unbelievable. But now you've got many, you know, it's more than just him that can throw over a hundred. Is that something that the major league umpires, you, you, it was so quick to get to that level, the higher velocity, you'd notice that and notice that as, as something. Yeah. I, I remember, I think one of the first I ever saw throw a hundred was uh, uh, Bartow Cologne. Uh, and you know, everybody now remembers he was throwing slow or not throwing so hard, but at one time he was one of the hardest throwers the game had, but there was, you know, two in the game that threw a hundred. Now there's two in every dugout that, uh, that throws a hundred. So, and, and everybody that doesn't throw a hundred seems to throw 97 and 98. So yeah, it, it's, it's evolved and it's evolved, uh, rather quickly. And, uh, you know, you talk about equipment, you had to evolve with that and you had to do it in a hurry because mm-hmm. there's very little makeup time for those kind of, uh, pitches that get on you at those kind of speeds like i said they can uh they can uh render you useless for the rest of the uh the season yeah we don't want that for sure um no. well you know i i, I tell you what i've really I've, i'm so much enjoyed uh so much of this conversation between hearing about your career and, and some of the stories uh that you have i know you have a lot of stories over your over your long career um loving hearing the conversation about umpire gear and, and it sounds like you made some really great suggestions to a lot of the um, uh, the amateur community and that is you know to to don't uh don't mess around with your safety um uh and, and think about upgrading especially if you move up levels or um you know over time and I, I appreciate that but one thing i really want to spend time talking to you tonight about i didn't want to certainly didn't want to overlook it and 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 now you can maybe talk a little bit good about jim reynolds uh and talk a little bit about uh your involvement with umps care charities uh, obviously, Umps Care is the um, uh, the official charity of Major League Baseball umpires, and um, we have had a very proud history uh, of of support for Umps Care, and that started out a great deal uh, with you and things that you and Marvin Hudson were doing um, along with Sam Durth back in the day 
which seems like a long time ago, um, where you all were actually uh, working with blue, what, what they called at one time, blue for kids. Right. So tell me a little bit about blue for kids and how that started and maybe a little bit about how that's a precursor to Ump's Care. Well, all the credit goes to uh, Marvin Hudson. Marvin, uh, we were down in spring training and uh, Marvin just walks in one day and, and says, hey, listen, I've got some uh, kids that are going to be coming over from the, uh, you know, uh, boys club and, uh, you know, big brothers, little sisters, uh, big sisters and those kind of uh, programs. And it was just people that he had gone out, made contact with. Uh, we get a few tickets for spring training and we left them for these kids and we were going to have them in that environment, uh, which is, again, at that time, spring training's, you know, very relaxed. So we were going to have them down, maybe take them out on the field for batting practice and that kind of thing. And, and uh, that's what we did. And it was a, it was a really good thing to give some local kids, uh, some at risk kids, a chance to, uh, to be a part and see some things uh, at a baseball game that they might not have ever seen before or ever even had a chance to see. So uh, Marvin started that. Uh, we did it a, a couple of years. And next thing you know, it, it, it got so popular that, you know, we needed to think about where we're going to go from there. And that's when Jim and some other people came in and, and you know, started uh, brainstorming with Marvin. And uh, ultimately it became uh, Ump's Care. And then we broke off into, you know, five, six divisions of Ump's Care and what we do there as well. And, and I can just tell you, for me personally, uh, you know, we'll do a lot of things over the course of the season as far as getting to see Cal Ripken uh, break the records that he broke and all these kind of things. But uh, nothing lives deeper in my heart than the time that we have with Ump's Care. I, I, don't, I don't just love it. I am as proud as I, uh, of our charity as I could be of anything in my life because it, one, it is our charity. And two, uh, we do some good things and we do some good things to help some people that, uh, that you know, don't have a lot of necessarily good things going on in their life at, at, at that time. And, and uh, I'm just thrilled to death to be a part of it. And I'm honored to be uh, a part of this group that gets to, to help some of these uh, kids and, and, uh, and, and make their day better for a little while. Well, you know, you and, and many others, including Jim Reynolds and, you know, just the, the involvement that I see, uh, the participation um, of, of, of the major league umpires in, in this is just so, so much. I know at one time when um, Samuel Durth was the one, he's a, the executive director before JSP, right. before Jen now, uh, for those of you who don't know, and he was the one that got us involved in, in Ump's Care. And I recall then it was, you know, very much in its infancy. And he, he referenced Marvin very often, uh, you know, his involvement and uh, talked a lot about Laz and, and, um, and, and, but, at, you know, then it was very much, uh, like you said, it was, uh, uh, you all called it the, um, and I guess you still call it that, the, um, uh, the Blue Crew Ticket Program, right? So, yes. um, so, you know, walk us, walk us through that. What does that look like? We talk about that a lot. We share information and say, hey, so support Ump's Care Charities. They have this program called Blue Crew, um, uh, where they give tickets to, um, uh, to youth, underprivileged youth in the area. Paint us a picture of what that looks like uh, when, when you have that program. Okay. Well, the way that'll be is, is uh, you know, on any given day throughout the, the season, uh, we'll have typically – you know, anywhere from between four and six at-risk kids uh, with, you know, either boys, girls, girls club. It can be, it can be with anything, uh, but we'll take them and their big brother, mentor, uh, and we, we take them, the, the, the kid themselves and their mentor, bring them down on the field. Uh, they get to see batting practice. They get to stand on a big league field and look around from down there and see just how much that stadium actually grows when you're down there and, and instead of up there in the seats. And, and the biggest thing that we do is when we're done with them, we don't send them out to the uh, cheap seats out in the outfield. We send them to some really good seats uh, that we have uh, working with some of the teams that are, that do a, a great job of working with us. And we can't be uh, more appreciative than, than we are with what, with what they do in the way that this thing has grown with them. And then we give them a, a grab bag. And then this grab bag, you know, it'll have uh, 
it'll have some popcorn and Cracker Jacks and a, a maybe a local hat from the team and and these different things. And then it has a uh, a gift card that they can take up to the stands and they, they can go out and get popcorn and anything that they want, just like everybody else is doing that day because we want that day to be just like it is for anybody else. We don't want them to, uh, to feel slighted at all. And they, and they don't, and, uh, and, and they, they just get to go. And some of them, you know, are, you know, some of them are seven, eight years old. Some of them are 10, 15 years old living in these cities their whole lives and have never been to a Kansas city Royals game or a Baltimore Royals game. So it's a, it's a big deal. And it's, it's good to have the mentors involved as well, because they deserve to be a part of that, that day as well uh, for all the good work that they do. So it's just a, it's just an unbelievable program. Uh, that's, that's what it all started with as far as, uh, you know, having people out on the field and, and doing those things. And I'm seeing the pictures that you're, you're putting up and, and that's what we do. And then uh, they go up and sit in the stands. And again, they don't go, they don't go out into the outfield. They go up and, and sit in some really good seats and, and get to feel for that day, just like a, 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 a VIP. A high, yes. A VIP. Right. It's, there you go. It's a VIP getting mm -hmm. to sit in the good seats, watching the game. And, and the only thing I tell them is every, I tell them every time that, I've got microphones and no seats. And if you're ever yelling at one of the umpires, I'll stop the game and embarrass you up there. So. <laughs> but one thing you also uh, started doing, you know, at, at one point in the evolution of Umpscare Charities are hospital visits, right? And then, you know, when you, when you grow up and you, 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 you hear stories about players uh, visiting hospitals and, and, and bringing a smile to, uh, you know, kids' eyes who may have cancer, other uh, heart issues and things like that. But you all started doing that um, as well along the way, right? Tell, paint a picture of what that is like for an MLB umpire crew to be in a city and go to a children's hospital and have an event there. Okay, so we were doing the, the Blue Crew Ticket program, and we did that for a few years. And then we're, we're just thinking, you know, or the way it came about is, you know, we're in these cities 24 hours a day. We've got the baseball game that takes up three of those. So we got 21 hours that, you know, what are we doing? What can we possibly do that makes, that really touches some people? And, and we, uh, we decided to start the hospital visits. And what we do is, is we visit Children's Hospital and we take a Build-A-Bear and uh, outfits that the, the, the kid gets to uh, pick from. And we go to uh, to visit these these kids that are at that time in, in some pretty difficult spots. Um, you know, uh, I, I would love to tell you that, that they're all uh, well and everything's going to be great. But that's not what it's about. It's about going and seeing these kids and, and, and making that part of their day special, making that part of their day uh, doctor and needles and and everything else that uh, comes with being in the hospital free of that just for a a, a few short minutes you know uh, it is by far become the most special thing to me that we do I mean uh, you know you go see these kids and and kids are just being kids they're happy to see you they're extremely happy to see the builder bears but the thing that that has given me uh, probably more satisfaction than anything is not the kids, it's the parents. And it's the parents for me because of one reason, uh, I always make contact and, and, and kind of look over at the parents at some point and I can see the happiness and what it does for the parents because they're getting to see their child who obviously hasn't been able to be uh, a child in the last few months, days, whatever, because of the situation they're going through be a child again. And, uh, and I can't tell you that the, the feeling that gives me because I have kids and just by the grace of God, we could all be in that situation one day. And to think that people, uh, you know, not only take the time uh, to show up with a bear, but just to give their time to come and show up and say, you care somebody thinks about you for somebody that doesn't know you and never will see you again. But, uh, it's a, it's a 
huge impact on me. Uh, I think it's a big impact on the parents. I know that it's something that I can see in the kids' eyes that it's it's huge for that day, and it's just a beautiful thing. And uh, you know, everybody that's ever given money to help us support this uh, charity and this cause, I can tell you that you know, although you never get to see the direct results of what your donations do, I can tell you that uh, those donations and what they've allowed us to do have changed my life because uh, the Cal Ripken things and all those, they're beautiful, but there's nothing, nothing like uh, helping out somebody that's on, on tough times. And uh, I guess that's it with the, uh, the hospital visit. It's a, it's a, it's an emotional thing, you know? Right. Well, I know, you know, we, like, we spend a lot of time talking about that, you know, support UMS care, support the auction because they support programs like the blue, uh, the brew crew ticket program and also the hospital visits. But I wanted to hear from you, what, you know, what that, you know, was like, you know, and, and what you saw and the difference that that makes. And I've been fortunate enough to go to um, a few of your hospital visits. Um, went to one so of you've seen it. I went with one of you in, uh, in Kansas City um, yep. yeah, years back. And, um, and, and, and just, you know, I recall that just like what you said, the, the look on the kids' faces to be able to take a break from their illness for the parents to take a break from their illness. They're living at 24 seven. And, um, and I know that, you know, they may not have heard who Cubby is the major league baseball umpire and crew chief, but when they, they see that, you know, this is the person who is going to be umpiring the game that they're probably going to watch, you know, on TV that night, or they watched the night before and, and that connection that it makes. And, um, and I, I, I just love, uh, love what you all have done. Uh, to be able to use your you very unique situation, right? You're the only ones that can do what you do. And, um, and that is to be able to take the kids into the ballpark, to be able to go to the hospital visits and to use your time in that way. But what another reason I liked uh, about Ump's Care is you continue to grow and you keep doing new things. You started out with a Blue Crew ticket program. You started doing the hospital visits. And now you've added a scholarship. Tell us about your scholarship. Yeah, that's another part of the program that I uh, need to say we're, we're very uh, proud of. You know, we, what we've constantly tried to do is, is touch people that, that aren't always in a position to be touched, right? Well, there's one group of kids that have historically just always been left out, and that's kids that have been adopted, and especially kids that have been adopted later in life. First of all, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's somewhere around eight or nine that if a kid's not adopted by eight or nine, the numbers drop drastically that they'll ever be adopted and they'll spend their life, uh, their time in the orphanage until they become legal age and then go on. Well, you know, people don't have the opportunity. You know, when I had my kids, uh, we started planning from day one for one day when they decided to go off to college. We had the benefit of knowing that they were born and then taking and trying to put something aside. Well, people that adopt somebody later in life, that just comes on them, whether they it was uh, planned or not planned or whatever they did. But all of a sudden, you know, these kids decide to go to school and you've got nothing to pay for some of these. As you know, I've got a kid right now that's in college and they're not exactly giving those tuitions away. But um so we looked into that and we decided to start up a scholarship program for kids that have been later, uh, adopted uh, later in life. And we uh, give $10,000 per year to that kid that we, uh, that we uh, choose. And, and we've had just unbelievable uh, success with that. You know, it started off, nobody had heard of us. Uh, we just about had to hunt people down to, to, to give the, the scholarship to, and now, that has changed where it is quite a process to, to be that person that is chosen every year. So it is, um, it's unbelievable. There's been some great success stories come from it. Uh, uh, again, you, you know, some of them have come to speak to the umpires and 
at the uh, golf outing and things like that, tell us their story of what they uh, went through as a, a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the fact that they were able to uh, take this money that changed their life as far as, you know, not leaving uh, college heavily in debt. And uh, it, it's a difference maker. It's, you know, all these things are difference makers. Hopefully one of the kids on the, the, the blue crew ticket program will remember that day and, and try to do better or want more and all these things just make that hope a little bit better than it was the day before. And then hopefully, you know, all the kids that we visit in the hospital need to say, we, we pray to God that all of them get well, but if we just make them happy for that little bit of time, there's that. And we, we give them again, the hope for, for the parents and everybody else. And then you take all the way up to the scholarship program, these kids that hopefully we give them hope, for the future that didn't seem so bright just a few right. years earlier. And uh, so all these things are built around hope and, and the future and what it might bring to them. And again, I, it's like I said, I just, I am so proud to be a, a part of this. It's a good thing. Uh, there's no way you can be wrong in this, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I mean, being involved in this is, uh, is really big. It's good to give, uh, to these people and it's 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 now it's it's good to be able to watch with the scholarship program what they become mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. because a lot of these uh, a lot of these kids that for for whatever reason you know we just won't ever get the opportunity to see again well we get that opportunity with the scholarship program we get to see what they become and what they do and and all those things and uh you know it's it's good to be able to see that that uh final product yeah, and I think that's one thing you know that that um, you know people don't completely understand how involved major league umpires are in their charity work, and they do it through Ump's Care. And I applaud you, and I applaud everyone else who's been involved in Ump's Care. And you know it has an effect on you because you know I notice when people retire, when uh, they still they still are involved. You know, you look at Gary Darling. Um, and you look at, uh, Mike Everett who just, uh, retired, but it, 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 it they, now they want to do even more, it seems. So, um, yeah. so, you know, the, 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 effect, one thing I like about Ump's care as a donor is, and I, and I would, and I think that's also, you know, something, um, for others to want to give money and support Ump's care is you see how much that money goes directly to need. I forget what the number is, something like 92% of the money that goes to Ump's care goes directly to, uh, those in need, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, larger uh, corporations out there, or larger nonprofits, a lot of the money goes to overhead and, and marketing and things like that. 92%, at least the last I heard, you know, bumps care charities goes directly to the need. So, you know, you make an impact, you know, that if you make a donation, um, that that goes a long way. And, you know, not only do you all do the blue, the blue crew ticket program, you also do the scholarship, you do the hospital visits. But one thing you don't talk about, because you don't brag about it, is the family committee because you give money um, and assistance, let's just say assistance to umpires and not just major league umpires. We're, we're you know, we're, you're not just the, uh, the program that gives money to uh, professional players that have fallen to hard times. You, you know, it's something where, whether it's college umpire, amateur umpire, um, I've seen situations where there have been, um, you know, houses who have, have burned down or uh, families with cancer. Uh, where your family committee jumps in and provides assistance to umpires on all levels. Yeah, we, uh, that was kind of one of the, uh, the grassroots part of, of uh, Ump's Care as well, where we want to, uh, to get back and, and, you know, because, you know, back in the day when this thing first started up, uh, umpires were not making the, the salaries that they make today. So you had, uh, you know, uh, widows uh, that were just, you know, barely able to uh, scrape by on um, what they had done uh, work-wise for the their whole life. So we started and uh, look at it to, to help people that needed some help there in the umpiring community. Uh, like you said, we, we uh, passed that on down to the minor league level as well to help people that, uh, you know, if they were just really falling on hard times, uh, we take some of uh, the money that we had set aside and, and try to help them where we could where we could help them. You know, needless to say, we're not a big enough uh, uh, organization. We're certainly trying to get there. Trying to get there. We're not. 
yeah, we're not a big enough organization to start paying off huge uh, uh, um, uh, number of things, but uh, we could help and we could uh, relieve some of the, the aches and pains in different areas that, that help somebody, you know, if, if we took care of their electricity or we took mm-hmm. care of their water or, or made a car payment, you know, or something like that. It was just, it was enough to get them over that hump to where it, uh, it made a difference. So listen, we branched off into places that quite frankly, we never could have envisioned it going. Uh, all of them have worked out well, but they work out well because first of all, we got good people. Like you said, Gary Darling, Gary hasn't been on a baseball field now in a few years, but I can tell you this, he is still working as hard today for umps care as when he was on the field taking care of it then as well. Jim Reynolds, I bust Jim's uh, honey all night long about his <laughs> lack there of umpiring, but uh, no, actually Jim's awesome at this job, but he works. Uh, he, I mean, the amount of hours that he puts into umps care over the years has just been unbelievable. It's second to none. And then we, uh, you know, we have uh, three uh, just unbelievable ladies that help run this thing and keep it afloat. Uh, we got Jen, Jen, and Amy. Right. And the work, the work that they do, and and the ideas that they have come up with, even during this uh, pandemic and things like that, to to keep Unc's Care relevant and keep our name out there, and to keep moving and and keep making things positive. It's just it's unbelievable. And, and, and face it, you can't you can't do any of these things just by yourself. And it's these people working in the background that has made this thing just absolutely beautiful and and made it fresh all the time, keeps it fresh, comes up with these new ideas. And uh, like I said, I'm I'm not only proud to be a, 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 a person that umpires and is a part of Ump's Care, I am just uh, honored to be friends with some of these people that do the work they do behind the scenes because they're never seen mm-hmm. you know the gent the gent gen squared and amy right. are very rarely seen but yet they're the ones out there that are you know making sure that the people are where they need to be and helping us raise the money and helping us come up with the ideas on how to raise the money and jim reynolds is working night and day setting up uh, golf deals in between missing calls and then you got gary darling uh, who, like I said, just, you know, has, has just given his, now his retired life to Ump's care. And that's, you know, that says a lot about Gary and, and what he thinks of this organization. And uh, I'm just proud, proud to, to be a part of it. It's a, well, big, you it's a to, big deal to me. And, you know, and this year, especially being 2020 with all things going on, we talked earlier on in the, in the interview, you know, about how difficult a year it was and how you were looking forward to be done with. And, um, and I know, but this is a year that Ump's Care has really stepped up. You know, not every, a lot of people have stopped doing things. You know, Ump's Care has stepped up. Last I heard, over 2,000 volunteer hours from Major League umpires. Um, here there's a lot of, you know, worry about Major League umpires working in the bubble and, and, and getting COVID and things like that. And, and we certainly don't want that to happen, haven't want that to happen. And, and you all have spent a lot of time this year uh, giving back because people are certainly in need this year. And last I heard, it was over 2,000 you know, hours that you've given uh, to that. And I applaud you all for that. And it's not just a major league. You mentioned it. I'm glad you touched on it. You know, one thing I'm really um, have been really um, excited about is how many minor league umpires have been involved in, in, in um, um, absolutely and how it's, yes. how, and I think that's brought a whole new energy and a whole new life to it. You know, obviously there's only so much of you all to go around um, when you're talking about, you know, 70, 76 or, uh, or so major league umpires, but you've got 230 minor league umpires. So that's a, that's a whole army. They are full of, uh, people that can, that can, that can make a big difference. And I know they do the bowling tournament that raises so much money every year. They do. And it's just amazing, you know, that the, what they've done. And so it, it's really, you know, gravitating down, you know, um, uh, to, and I'm hoping that, you know, at some point I'm seeing more college umpires do things and be interested in things and, and being involved in, in, in golf, um, uh, 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 fundraising and things like that. So, you know, kudos to everybody. And, and, and you know, all the umpires, but also, like you said, the staff, uh, Jennifer Skolachinko Platt, who's the executive director, um, and Jennifer Joplin, who's the assistant, and Amy Rosewater, who's the marketing director. 
Um, they are a great resource for a lot of ideas. And one of the ideas that they were able to do this year uh, was in honor of, uh, of Major League umpire Eric Cooper, who passed right. away <clears throat> this time uh, last year, just before the World Series started. And, and they have come up with a, um, uh, a challenge to help raise money in his memory uh, to go toward uh, what is now going to be the, uh, the Eric Cooper Memorial Scholarship. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, needless to say, it was, uh, it, it was a, a difficult, as a matter of fact, today is uh, also the anniversary of uh, Chuck Merriweather's passing. So, uh, you know, within a very short period, we lost a, a couple of dear friends and, and even better men. And, uh, you know, I, I, I texted a few umpires this morning telling them that I, I, don't, I don't know of anybody in my life that is a, a better person, nor do I expect to ever meet anybody that's any better than Chuck Merriweather. Just a good man, right? And uh, the same for Coop. He was a dear friend. Coop and I were, we, we got in close to the same time. We, we worked together at the umpire school, at Brinkman's umpire school. And it was uh, tragic to say the least. But, uh, you know, Coop loved Ump's Care. He was uh, highly involved with it. And uh, that's the reason uh, they decided, to, we decided to name the scholarship this year after Coop. And uh, uh, one way, again, and, and, you know, now all of a sudden you have this pandemic. And that's when the uh, Jen Squared and uh, Amy jump in. And instead of just sitting on the sidelines and thinking, yeah, you know what, nothing's going to take place, we'll just kind of, was we'll sit idle for a while. They didn't allow that. They came up with these different things that we're going to do, and and we're going to scrape together every penny that we can. And we're going to uh, we're going to again keep this thing relevant, and we've done that, and we've we've done now that in in Coop's honor as, as well uh, by uh, having the fifty six challenge, and that's where you know challenge people to uh, to uh, see if they can get people to donate to the cause for whatever they said that they could come up with that they would do in honor of his number, which is 56. So I made the deal with my uh, wife that we have a a new grandchild now that uh, as long as that I was at the house uh, for 56 diaper changes, I would be in charge of them. She wouldn't have to do them. I would do them. Well, little did I know that would turn into 256. But anyway, uh, everybody's got their thing they came up with and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to raise some, uh, some good money from that and, and continue on the legacy of, of Eric Cooper and what he meant to Ump's care. So, um, so yeah, you, you, you said that you had, uh, uh, had a lot of off time this, this season. And, and so, uh, making up for being home, you, those, those diapers were something that you, you made sure we're a part of uh, part of that. So I think you made up, made up for that for sure. So, so good kudos to you on that. Uh, Well, it's, you know, it's been a while since I changed one you know, I always, when with the, uh, with our kids, I always planned them perfect. They, uh, all of them were born right around March. So the kids would be born and then I would take off and go umpire for the rest of the year. And I'd leave my wife there. (laughs) she had to sit there and take care of, uh, of these kids every year by herself. So we've got the grandkid now and I'll pitch in and do my part. So well, we're talking about, good paybacks. we're talking about the, um, um, I want to make sure I get the 56 in there, right? It's the hashtag coop 56 challenge, uh, um, secure charities. It's going on right now. It started on October 20th. It's running through the world series. I believe the date they have on it is ending on October the 28th. Uh, Ump's Care is encouraging everyone in memory of Eric Cooper, uh, affectionately known as Coop, um, uh, for for everyone to do something at 56, whether you walk 5.6 miles, uh, 5,600 steps, um, uh, bike that much, um, uh, eat 56 bags of M&Ms like Cubby did, um, change 56 diapers. And it's really brought out a lot of uh, really creativity uh, Matt McMahon, a college umpire, did 56 chip shots. Um, Willie McCongle, uh, I think, has done 56 push-ups every day uh, throughout the World Series. Um, uh, Gary Darling and uh, Dan McGinnis do what they do best, which is playing golf, and they played 56 holes in memory of, <laughs> of, of Eric, right? We're going to have to get them creative on, on some other things besides, besides uh, 
uh, golf, but they do what they do best. And, and um, uh, I'm trying to get up here to show you, we did a, uh, I need to really show that to you. We put on 56 umpire shirts here at the office. We, I, we had a big debate on whether we could do it. And so we took a skinny guy and started him out with smalls and ended up, uh, I think with four X, uh, and we, we made it happen. So, uh, so we all uh, have all done our part to do the challenge. Uh, Jake Ostern uh, is an amateur umpire up in the Northeast. Uh, I think he has done things every day, 56 baskets, uh, shooting, uh, shooting basketball. Uh, awesome. From memory, what I've seen on that. Uh, certainly anyone who's uh, watching us on Facebook Live tonight uh, or they watch us recorded and they hear, hear us talking about it, all you have to do, whether you're in Facebook or Twitter, uh, is to do hashtag coop 56 challenge and you will see all the work being done out there um, in in uh, in coop's memory uh in name of the scholarship and uh, uh it's all there and and so it's really kind of taking a life of its own uh, i look today the goal the goal that they had that ump's that you had ump's care uh was fifty six hundred dollars and it's up to twenty thousand dollars right now so well, that's, that's I, 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 I tell you, you know, it's, it's always humbling. Uh, you know, anytime that we have our uh, drives, we have our, our golf tournament, any, any time that we've ever stepped up and, and challenged people to help, uh, it is amazing. It is amazing what people will do, what they've always done for us, especially in times like this, face it, you know, there's people that are, out of work there's people that are uh, down on their luck right now because of this pandemic but you know what people they just they're still coming through and and they're helping you know ultimately they're helping the people that we talked about a, a few minutes ago the the at-risk kids the kids that are in the children's hospitals and the the kids that are uh adopted later in life but uh it's just uh it's unbelievable how you know no matter what the situation and the times that we've asked people to help us, if they were able, what they've done and, 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 and shoot for 5,600 and ending up with uh, that amount. It, I would love to say it surprises me, but it doesn't anymore because uh, I think people are starting to, to get a real good look at this, uh, at this charity and see the work that we're doing and understand, like you said earlier, the, the, the huge amount of, of the donation is going directly to the causes itself. And uh, that's something that's easy to get behind. And, uh, you know, again, I've said it a, a thousand times already tonight, but it puts a smile on my face. This thing is just good. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just honored to be a part of it in any way. I hate that we're having to do it in Coop's honor. I'd rather have Coop here with us right now, but, uh, I'm sure he's up there right now and, and uh, he's uh, making his pitch for donations as well. Yeah. And speaking of, uh, you know, pitches, you know, go to umpscare.com and, and look up the Coop 56 challenge and you'll come to this really great page that was put together where you can either become a fundraiser um, and try to raise money, or you can just directly donate toward the cause and get that goal up even further. Um, I'd love to see this get up to 56,000 before uh before it's all over with but you'll find information about how to register um how to do your your 56 challenge it's all on there on on umps care and so i wanted to bring that to your attention and also uh th those of you who are listening and also if you go to umps care umps care's got a great store uh you'll see that uh up in the top right click on the store and you'll see these great 56 coupe uh shirts that you're seeing you've seen umpires wear those um throughout the uh you know um uh, in the locker room, some great shots. If you're not following Ump's Care Charities on social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to see all the great pictures um, that Major League Umpires are doing, you'll see them wearing this this uh, uh, Coop 56 shirt. And the, they're, most of them are sold out now, uh, but this, there are more coming. Um, and this is, this is a really great shirt. And this is another way to support Ump's Care uh, is to go to their shop and their store and and see what they have to offer i've always noticed uh, they always buy the really good stuff everything is super high quality and so if you didn't know that ump's care always has a store there uh speaking of a combination of, of selling things and donations uh, we were able you all sent us these really great bracelets um over a year ago 
And we have been selling these bracelets, uh, Cubby, you may not have been aware of this, but we sell the Ump's Care bracelets, the ones they give away um, at the, the, some of the events. We sell these for $3.99 on our website. And we've said you know, to the gin, send us these, we'll sell these, and we'll donate the money back to you. So, um, so you see these, these bracelets awesome. here. We've sold over 500. And so uh, tonight really? we are going to add to the donation of the, um, the Coop Challenge. We're going to add a check for $3.99 times 500, which is a $2,000 check uh, to Ump's Care. Uh, and that's really all the people who are listening in. That's, that's their support. They're the ones that paid the money to get the bracelets, order the bracelets when they ordered all that umpire gear to go with it. And we're just passing along. That's all we're doing. This is, this is pass along from our customers, um, all the great amateur umpires out there who are customers from Little League to high school to college. We appreciate everything you do in supporting us and Ump's Care. And we're going to pass this donation along to you, $2,000 to add to the Coop 56 Challenge. Well, I personally can't thank you enough. And, and, and I want you and the people that, like you said, purchased uh, those uh, bracelets to know that that's how this group is. That's how this group is, has maintained itself and how it got started. It got started at $3 and 99 cent at a shot. You know, it, it's, it's not this thing where we, I wish it were, I wish we had people giving, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars and maybe one day it'll get there. That's certainly what our goal is, but it's made up of a grassroots grass, uh, uh, group of people that, that just, Give here five, 10, 15, 20, whatever they can. And I tell you one thing, it all adds up and it all gets us where we need to be at the end of the year where we can make all those events uh, just as exciting and worthwhile. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. Uh, I can't thank you enough for doing that uh, because you, you know, uh, just a little shout out to you. You've always been, like you said, You've been good to this group. You've been here since day one, and uh, we're grateful for that. It's been a good relationship, and um, I hope that you feel like you get something back from some of these uh, events that you've been able to attend as well, and uh, we appreciate your help with that. Well, thank you for saying that, and, and I've enjoyed it immensely, the experiences I've been able to receive and our staff. You know, our staff is also all on board, uh, all in to Ump's Care. You know, we didn't talk much about the Blue Crew Insiders program uh, that you launched this year. Another really great thing. I mean, we've talked so much. There's so many great things going on. But uh, yeah, I've got most of my staff are, you know, on the, are, are also Blue Crew Insiders, too, yeah. and, uh, and pay their monthly donation. And like you said, it doesn't have to take much to start somewhere, whether you buy a bracelet for $3.99, whether you donate monthly via uh, Blue Crew Insiders for $5 a month, whether you do something through the uh, Coop 56 Challenge, $56, uh, or you do something 56 times and you donate 56 bucks, there's, there's a way to get in and way to help um, in some way, or you become a major donor. There's all, these, the, all that in between. And uh, we certainly appreciate everything you've done. We appreciate you being on the call tonight. I think this has provided such a great perspective on who Cubby is, uh, to, as no. I know to people who are watching. And they've seen, well, I, seen a certain side of you where, uh, and I'd hope to try to bring that out tonight with, um, with, with sharing some of your background and come from a small town. And, and I, cause I know what that's like being from a small town and, and then, and then becoming something, um, and becoming a successful person, uh, but not just a su successful umpire, but, but also a great person. And I know that you, the impact you make and the impact Ump's Care uh, makes, uh, it really is true and really is there. And I appreciate the time you've given tonight to basically to the umpire community. And that's uh, those who are listening in are just a part of the umpire community. They're social media people who follow along. They know what's going on with, um, uh, with umpiring at many levels. They, they're, we, you, you and I talked about umpire gear tonight. Some people out there know just as much as you and I know. They, they're <laughs> into it. And, and, and they have enjoyed getting to listen to you tonight and getting to know you uh, on a personal level. And, um, and I, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. And I can't thank you enough for, uh, for the year. And um, man, I'm like you, I, I want to get through this year, 2020 and move on to 2021. Well, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate you giving uh, me the opportunity to not only talk a little bit of baseball with you, uh, but to talk about umps care as well. Um, I'm sorry that everybody had to find out the truth about Jim Reynolds, uh, but it is what it is. And, <laughs> But don't don't feel too bad for him. You got to remember, he's from Connecticut, right? So so he's automatically one of the ten smartest people in the world. Right. 
So he'll be okay. But, uh, hey, listen, I've enjoyed this. I appreciate the time again that you gave uh, me to share my story. And I appreciate, more importantly, the, the chance that you gave me to uh, share the story of Ump's Care. That's a big deal to me right now. And as I wind down my career, it's going to become a bigger deal to me. And that's where I want to go. You know, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, when I got into this, I never wanted to, uh, on my tombstone, it have, uh, you know, he was an umpire. He umpired Major League Baseball. I wanted to say a whole lot more about what I did with my life. And Ump's Care is that thing that's, that's given me that opportunity to live outside of just being an umpire. So it's a big deal to me. As you can tell, I'm passionate about it. Uh, I hope one day to get it as big as we want it to be. And uh, I appreciate the time that you gave me tonight. It's fun. Absolutely, Kobe. I, I, I enjoyed this immensely. And I know, you know, I was looking at, down at some of the numbers. We had a lot of people on, on the Zoom call tonight. I, I think, and a lot of people stayed on the call and I know we, we ended up going a little bit longer than what we, we talked about going an hour. We went to, so, so it had, it had to have been good to have gone. That's that all right. And That's I think, right. uh, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and jump in and apologize to anyone who may have asked a question. I didn't even, I got so much in the conversation. I didn't get a chance to glance <laughs> back and try to read the questions. Uh, you know, so, sometimes we'll have a third on the call to help manage that, but I wanted yeah. to read the, what it was it, a conversation with you. And, and just let everyone listen in. And, and I, the, a lot of the questions were my questions. I wanted to know uh, some of the stories about uh, uh, that I've read about you and, and heard about you and to find, to find out, are they true? And the funny thing, they're all, they're all true. And, uh, and I think that's fascinating. And, and uh, I know this has been a, a, a crazy year for you. You've set out this year. Uh, I know you're looking forward to getting back on the field next year I am. and, uh, and I, and I respect you and I respect everyone who, who didn't opt out and, and who stayed in there that they're, they're going to have a story as well, you know, of, of, of this year. And, uh, you're already hearing some of that of how different that was this year. And it's very interesting. Um, and it's been, it's been an interesting year for, for a lot of us, but, uh, 2021 will be different than 2020. I can certainly guarantee you that. It will be. And, uh, you know, my hat's off to the guys that, that worked as well. And, and i tell you something. Uh, I've never been prouder of a group of people uh, in my life. I've always been proud to be a, a part of this group, but I'm even more proud now for the fact that, you know, they went out there, they did their job. Uh, they didn't uh, complain about it. They just went on and did it, uh, tested negative all summer long because they they went by the guidelines that were set and uh i'm just proud of them they made us look unbelievably good just like they always do and i'm 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 proud to hang my hat with uh with this group of guys and again i thank you for tonight yeah thanks cubby we're going to sign off thanks everyone for joining in and listening tonight on our uh dish episode of uh Listen to Fielding Cubby Colbreth. Uh, we've got some more dishes. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, in January 18th, we just lined up Chris Welsh, who is the Cincinnati Red sportscaster, who also is the founder of Baseball Rules Academy. There's going to be uh, something there, too, that you'll want to listen into. We'll have some more on there as well. But we're going to sign off. Thanks so much. You guys have a great night. Enjoy the rest of the World Series. Uh, it's back on tomorrow night. I'm so glad, Cubby, that you, you were able to fill in a night for us where there wasn't a game. Good. And, and we'll get right back to it tomorrow night. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Cubby. You guys take care. Bye-bye.